And I pushed that. Good. All right. Um, welcome to Silicon Valley Voice here on KKUP Cupertino. I'm Valley Sharp Geisler, and uh, today I have uh, Ron, Dr. Ron Weiss. He is this very interesting person. I think his life journey has been, um, you know, from one change to here to there. Uh, he's a doctor, of course, uh, and he's created this beautiful thing called Ethos Primary Care. But I get ahead of myself. I, I wanted to give uh, Dr. Weiss a chance to introduce himself and talk a little about his background before we, we start walking that path. Uh, Mr. Sure. Weiss. Dr. Well, Weiss. Thank, thank you for having me on today, Valley. And uh, it's a pleasure to be speaking with you today. Um, so, yeah, I, my background is I am born and bred in New Jersey all of my life, except for just a few years during my uh, training for medical residency. And um, I then came back to New Jersey. And um, I am a, a, a product of the state uh, educational system, went to uh, Rutgers, public school then Rutgers University for uh, undergraduate. I majored in botany uh, and piano performance. Because, uh, I've been a musician since uh, my very early years. And uh, then I went on to medical school at, at Rutgers, New Jersey Medical School. And um, I decided to go into primary care, into internal medicine for my residency because I felt that that was the greatest opportunity to prevent problems and um, get people to live a healthy lifestyle because you, you got to see people at the foundation of their illness at the beginning and before the beginning. And um, what happened was um, as the years passed and, and I was actually started to practice and it's, it was a long winding road and on this road, many things happened, including, you know, the, um, the death of my father from um, metastatic pancreatic cancer. And from that, I learned that my academic training with drug-based and chemo-based medicines was not valid. Um, and I learned that that was the, my portal of entry where I learned that whole plant foods and lifestyle were the most powerful treatments afforded to him. And that lesson I carried with me to my practice where I, uh, you know, was first an emergency room doctor and attending for about five or six years. And then I opened up a little medical center. It was, it was a, um, a whole little complete medical center in, on, on the busiest street in New Jersey doing everything from having an obstetric service to making house calls to having our own insurance plan for the uninsured, a cheap, you know, an inexpensive, comprehensive plan. Wow. And, and we took it open seven days a week, took care of everyone and everything, every problem. And as the years passed, I began to notice that although we worked very hard and we were taking care of a lot of sickness. The sickness was overwhelming our practice. And when I looked at the sickness, all the chronic diseases like the diabetes and the high blood pressure and the, the heart disease and the strokes and the autoimmune disease and the, the neurologic diseases and Alzheimer's, and dementia, obesity, and I began to realize remembering back to my father that um, that all uh, this raft of illness was being caused by the food people were eating and the food was coming from an industrialized and corrupted food system well one and of your so, videos one of the videos on your website says eating you alive yeah. and uh, and so what does that I mean, that sounds like you know, a parasite, you know, eating you alive. 
but it could be the opposite. <laughs> yes, you know that wasn't my. That's that was, that's a wonderful film that was that was made. We got cold called by two filmmakers who came and made this film called Eating You Alive. It's not our title. They have the title. I think it's a wonderful title. It is. Uh, uh, Samuel Jackson is in that movie, and and James Cameron, the filmmakers in the movie, and and. Dr. Esselstyn, Michael I love Dr. Esselstyn. Yeah, it's a wonderful movie, and um, that's the title they chose. And I think what it says is that, um, you know, I think that term sort of is used when something is eating you up alive. Right, right, it's, right. It's a, it's a negative. It's a negative connotation. Right. But I think in this context, it's used that uh, that plant whole plant foods. Or eat, eat, eating, or eating you alive, or in other words, if you eat them, they you will reconstitute you, your health. Right, right, right. right. Eat, if you eat them, you will become alive. You will become alive. Right. right. Exactly. I think no. that's the, the spin on that on the, the that old saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I kind of, I've, I've been a, a pl whole food plant eater for about five years myself. And um, I, I took um, Dr. Uh, Coleman's um, uh, uh, the the classes out on E. Cornell whole food plant based yes certificate. Oh my gosh, that was just it blew my mind. I had no idea the impact of the meat industry. Just looking at it as an industry and how it impacts the planet, I had no idea uh, the effect. Of food, I mean, I, the old saying, "You are what you eat." Yeah, you are what you eat, and and I had no idea the impact of the various foods. I mean, I considered myself somebody that who would research what I did, you know, what I ate, what I, I, I'm, I was a, a, a high protein gal, right? You know, right. I I was Atkins, so meat, 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 meat. And I mean, my when I look back, I. I the only thing that kept me alive and the reason I sit before you today was because I love salads. And yeah. so even though I ate meat and put meat on the top of it, a big right. steak or something, R right. I would have a salad, not like a cute little salad that sits you know, on a little dime sized plate. No, 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 I would have a family sized salad for a family of four, but I would eat that whole salad myself. Yeah. Well, and that did save you. It, that did save you. And so I had a similar experience when I was growing up, whereas, uh, you know, we would we were eating omnivorously, but my mother would serve my meals. I don't know why me, but I got the, for some reason, all, all of us when we were growing up had our own individual salad bowls and mine was huge it was like a family size <laughs> the others i don't know why it turned out that way the others the kids family their their salad bowls were like a fraction of the size so it was always filled up and that's what i always ate and you always had to eat that salad first before you could eat anything else and oh. then you got servings of vegetables and whatever so that when it came to the chicken or the meat yeah, it was sort of like a, it was almost like a side or an afterthought. Right. So it, I, I share that similar experience where, although when I was growing up, we were omnivorous, the plants and the, and it's particularly the salads were the main focus of the meat. Yeah, it makes a difference. And, and when I would eat that heavy food, sometimes, and I'd feel so lousy, not really understanding why, because I'm following it's everywhere. I mean, it's it's like lint. I mean, you can't turn around with. It's so common, and you know, high protein, high protein, high protein, and yeah. uh, and I I, I I had had the books. In fact, I just recently threw them out. <laughs> I had all the books. I read them. You know, blah yeah. blah, and uh, and then. One day, I um, a, a new store had opened up. It's a deli uh, in uh, in a place called Willow Glen, and it was called the, it's called the Source. And even through all this, they've managed to stay uh, viable. And so, I'm in there, and I go, "Gosh, you know." And the way I would say it, and the way I would say it to them, because I was still um, a high protein eater. 
um, meat eater, um, I would say to them, well, I got to veg up. So I come in here at lunchtime, I just want to veg up. <laughs> and they were pure vegan, right? And she's also, she makes her own uh, pastries and, and cupcakes, and they're all healthy, you know, with, with grains and, and um, you know, they're just, they're even, they're amazing. And so I go in there, and so every day I would go, or multi times a week I would go. And then she had these little juice things where you could go in like a juice fast. Well, what happened was you're talking to somebody who for a good 20 years could never lose weight. 20 years. I tried everything and I followed, you know, tooth and nail, but I could not. All of a sudden I'm having this juice fast. I'm losing weight. Oh, huh. So then I started just eating the food, just eating food. Okay. And I'm losing weight. I'm like, how is this possible? Oh my gosh. It's like a miracle. It's a miracle. You know, <laughs> and stuff, you know, you start, then she had all these books there. So I started reading, um, Dr. Campbell's book, Dr. Uh, of course, um, Dr. Greger's book, how not to die. Um, just, you know, just all different kinds. Of, and I, I was just stunned by what I was actually reading. Yes. And, and so that, uh, that was just quite an eye and every day it's been you know you run across that moment or I do where I go oh my gosh how could that possibly be <laughs> how did I miss this right. yeah, how, how could it possibly how could it possibly be and and furthermore not ever having been divulged to me or the public yeah right? it seems yeah. so important and that's what particularly outraged me. You yeah. know, I, I knew my father's story, and you know, who doesn't know that vegetables are good for you, right? I mean, your right. mother tells you. Who doesn't know that? But I never had it, I didn't appreciate, because I was not taught this in medical school, like the, the scientific foundation for nutrition that came along in the China study. And I remember reading that, and right. I became very angry that. Yeah. You know, obviously, these, this information had been known for a long time, but it was never divulged to me in my education and still is not to medical students in general. It's not. Right. Yeah. You learn more in um, the E. Cornell um, Absolutely. six weeks about the effects of food on your body and the effects of, of food on the planet, you know, the, the growing of food that make, you know, you learn more about that than in those six weeks than probably any doctor in, in college. Absolutely. Yeah. Just picking up, I would say picking up one of those books, whether it be the China study or prevent and reverse heart disease, uh, how not to die. Right. Um, just one of those books I challenge a medical student to read. And I think that that would give them more useful information in helping to heal people than with the entire four years of medical school. Yeah, yeah. Well, since we're talking whole food plant-based eating, um, give me like three good reasons why our listeners should uh, consider whole food plant-based or more importantly um, what about whole food plant-based is important for the human body well um, I think that um, just so in case your listeners are not aware or familiar with that term whole food plant-based I think um, it's important to address exactly what it is so uh, the first reason why it's good for the body is because number one, um, a whole food plant-based diet, uh, the main ingredients or in its highest form, the only ingredients are whole plant foods. And um, the way I look at it is sure, you know, as I said before, your mother told you vegetables and fruits are good for you. Who doesn't know that? But, you know, that's old cultural wisdom. And today, 
we have the science to back it up. So uh, when I started off with my father, things have evolved so quickly. You know, I saw him eating a plant-based diet and I saw him getting better, but I couldn't, didn't really understand why. Today, we have a lot of information about plants and how they help the human body. And um, the most powerful way they help the body is not primarily in and of themselves, although, you know, when you eat, let's say, um, when you eat a piece of celery and it has apigenin, which is a, 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 a very powerful plant molecule or phytochemical, that apigenin is an anti-angiogenesis factor. It helps to prevent cancer cells from getting access to blood supplies and growing. You know, that one molecule is important, but we now know that it's the whole plant that's most important as a feedstock to balance the ecosystem of your gut microbiome mm -hmm. in relationship to all the other whole plants you're eating. And, you know, we are now in the last decade or so coming to realize that plants revolutionize the gut microbiome, the universe of trillions of bacteria and microorganisms that literally control our health. So the first aspect of how eating whole plant food diet helps our body is by completely balancing and optimizing that gut microbiome so that everything flows from that. The second way that whole food plant-based diet is important for the human body. Well, wait, just one second. Talking about the microbiome, I mean, actually, they say we have more, we have, there's more DNA of this microbiome that lives in our intestinal system, in our bodies, than our DNA. <laughs> yes. If you take a composite analysis of, of a human life form, uh, yes, about there, I believe about twice, uh, there's twice the amount of microorganism DNA, including on our surfaces and in our intestine, than there is human DNA. Yeah, that's amazing. And you can get, a, you get a different microbiome when you're trying to digest meat, then when you're that's, trying yeah, to digest starkly plants. Different. Yeah. Starkly different. And that's and you can see it change rapidly even within 48 hours wow. of eating plants. Yeah. This life force is completely transformed. And right. that's why, if you want to know why somebody can drop their sugars, you know, it can be on insulin and you know, medications and you know, hypoglycemic agents and high blood pressure pills and all kinds of things, and then get better so quickly and lose weight so quickly, it's because of the change in that microbiome. All right, exactly. And, and, and meat doesn't really digest in a, in a human intestinal system like it would like in a cat, you know, or something, because it's so long and kind of, putrefies in there a bit yes, and, exactly. and so you put it in but remember it's got about 18 or how many feet is it anyway it's like 18 feet or something like that before it has to go through right. all that before it's I got out of your body and the microbiomes the little the little buglies that are in your gut that eat the meat and live on the putrefication actually exude chemicals that have a, a negative impact on your bowel. Absolutely. Like you set up a, an environment that might make it more pro-cancer. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, so you get that it's out very of there. Harmful. Yeah, you get that out of there. And now all of a sudden you don't have those, that micro, part of the microbiome is not yours anymore. And so you don't have that, that putrefaction and the um, effects of those you know, bad buglies. We want good buglies in there. Yes. <laughs> yeah. You know, people are always taking, looking for to take probiotics, right? Always looking for, buying them, purchasing them. And 
probably the best thing they can do is eat prebiotics because we really don't have, there's no evidence that by taking capsules of good bacteria, supposedly if they are good bacteria, who knows what is in those capsules, right? Because the field is completely unregulated and a lot right. of manufacturers are unethical and put things in these preparations uh, other than what's on the label. But uh, we have no evidence that even if there were good bacteria in those capsules, that they would end up surviving and altering the ecosystem of your colon. We don't know that. But we do know that if you just give feedstocks, these raw materials of whole plants, that the, the good denizens that reside in your gut will use them to grow in, in numbers and strength that completely overtakes the ecosystem and balances it and gives you the life force. Right, exactly. Yeah, but potatoes are supposed to be a good, uh, have things in it that are good prebiotic, I believe. Mm. Yeah, as it feeds the good guys. Well, I think, you know, there are, I, I, the way I look at it is, uh, you know, we, I try to encourage people to eat a wide variety. Yeah. The more diverse the foods, the better. And potatoes, you know, are a part, uh, play a role in that. But so do all the other starches and all the other roots and leafy greens and oh, yeah. soft vegetables and fruits and seaweed and whole grains and it's just everything. Yeah, yeah. Spinach. Legumes. I love spinach. Yeah. yeah. So what's another good reason why whole food plant-based is, is good to eat? I mean, we talked well, about because it, you know, we, we alluded to it because it, it avoids things that poison the body, and that is animal products. Animal products, for many reasons uh, that we have figured out already, cause chronic diseases, um, whether it is, and there's a long laundry list of things we know, whether it is because they have saturated fats in them, because animal foods do contain saturated fats, saturated fats are very harmful to us, whether it is because uh, they, um, they contain molecules like choline or carnitine, that when they end up in our gut, end up being metabolized into very caustic chemicals that damage our arteries. Uh, whether they be because animal foods, uh, when meat heating, animal flesh when cooked, uh, whether it be fish or meat or chicken or pork, when cooked on hot metal surfaces, uh, rearrange themselves to create highly carcinogenic molecules. Heterocyclicamines. Um, right. So for all those reasons, avoiding and more that we don't have time enough to go into, right. avoiding animal products is important. Oh, here's a, another one that I often tell patients with cancer about, is that animal products have proteins that come from animals. And those proteins we know spur on the production of insulin growth factor type one, which is a cancer cell fertilizer. So uh, another, the second great reason is because whole food plant-based diets are lacking and at their highest level, completely lacking in foods that come from animals and as well as processed foods, even if they come from plants, like oil, like vegetable oils, and sugar, like processed sugars, right? E even salt, right? Oh, so yeah. That's the second way that whole food plant based diets are good for your body. And the third thing that I often think about is that diets of whole plant foods uh, are very low down on the food chain. If you look at the food chain on our planet Earth, right? Uh, food begins and is first made by plants uh, who get, they get their energy 
to make food from the sun through photosynthesis. So that's the first step of the food chain. And then there are uh, uh, categories of higher organisms start eating those plants. But as the animals and the other living creatures start eating these plants, then you get eaten. If you ate a plant, then you get by, eaten by someone else. And then that, per, that organism that ate you gets eaten by yet another organism and so on and so forth up the food chain until you get to human beings who are at the top of the food chain, right? We have the power to kill and eat anything we want to, unfortunately. So environmental contaminants of which our earth is struggling fiercely under yes. this wrath of contamination. These contaminants build up to the highest levels as the food chain advances to the highest level. So eating plants um, at the lowest level of the food chain, uh, even if those plants are grown with biocides or toxic chemicals, are much lower in concentration of these bad chemicals than are, for example, a piece of organic uh, grass-fed red beef or a free-range chicken. So you're much better off eating plants. Because it, con it chemical contamination. Yeah, it concentrates in the animal. Exactly. And there's an, um, when we talk about you know, high protein diet, high protein, high protein, the reality is your body makes lots and lots of proteins when it needs them, right? So, exactly. so we don't need the protein, we need the building blocks. And meat, meat doesn't have, I, I, I don't want to quote the wrong number, but I want to say it's a handful. It's like six or eight proteins of a certain type. And the body makes like hundreds. So uh, we're eating like six all the time when really we just need to eat the building blocks and let, let the body do its thing. I know. P people are under the misconception, many people, um, you know, according to theories that developed out of the 19th century about nutrition and protein, that, uh, that Colin Campbell, you often hear him speak about, that people need this protein, this high quality protein that comes from animal to be healthy. But we know that that's false. And, and Colin Campbell, who is, you know, whose shoulders I stand on in addition to other great people in the field, helped to show that in his research and his life's work, and that we don't need animal proteins. And as a matter of fact, proteins from animals are known to be deleterious to our health. Like for example, I mentioned before that they specifically increase levels of insulin growth factor type one in our body. Plant proteins don't do that. And when you read the China study, you'll find out that that's the basis for cancer cell development or a, a, a significant cause. Right. Um, um, and, in, and in that book, he also discussed that <clears throat> if you're eating down around 9 to 12% protein, as opposed to 30% or above protein in your diet, your body functions differently when you're 30% when you're oh. above, that's when you start to see a, a lot more cancer generation, and and I I don't want to just uh, uh, generalize here, but your body just has the toxins. It it's dealing with the protein, and here here's the kicker: excess protein is turned into fat. <laughs> so what are we well, doing to ourselves? What was uh, I doing well, to myself? Yeah, well. And, it, you know, in general, we eat too much protein, right? right. So the, even the federal nutrition guidelines say that an average man, the average woman should have about 45 grams per day, average man in America, 55 grams. But the same average individuals end up usually consuming double that. Even, right. even uh, and most of it, almost the vast majority of it is all these toxic animal protein. Even if you look at a high level plant-based person, 
uh, eating, you know, vegetables and fruits and legumes and whole grains. You know, an average, you know, good eater in a plant-based world can get anywhere from 60 to 80 grams of protein today, uh, you know, per day, even exceeding what the federal government's recommendation is. So it really makes seeking, constantly seeking out protein, figuring out where it's going to come from, and uh, trying to make that animal proteins uh, really doesn't make a lot of nutritional sense. We're talking with Dr. Weiss on KKUP Cupertino. Uh, this is Silicon Valley Voice and Valley Sharp Geisler. What led you, uh, Dr. Weiss, to create Ethos Primary Care? What is that, that beautiful thing? Well, um, you know, I, um, I think in the, in the beginning, uh, of our talk, I, I was telling you about how I began to become frustrated when I realized that midlife, a, a number of things um, started to occur at the same time. Uh, I think, um, you know, our health care, I'm sorry, medical care system, it's not really a health care system. I know, old habits. <laughs> but, right, came to bear down, and, and it's still to this day on primary care so that it just became so exhausting to try and take care, good care of patients who are so sick yeah. through that system with very little resources, very low reimbursement, so much demand, so much paperwork that I started to fail. And uh, at the same time, so I, and I began to, you know, just become extremely, frustrated to, uh, I guess, the point of having a midlife crisis where I saw my practice was failing economically. Um, I saw that, um, I saw that uh, all this disease that was coming was, was the product of our food system. And at the same time, uh, I'd been recently married. This is when I was in my early 40s and I had two young children. And the thought that as I saw the world, you know, being degraded environmentally and the health of the world, I began to fear that, that uh, my children, by the time they were my age, would no longer have a planet to live on. So I decided to take all these ideas and just change uh, what I was doing. And that's how the idea for closing my practice, I sold it. I took, in my other assets, I took all of the, um, all of the money that I got for that and I bought this old farm. And I decided to reconstitute my medical practice in the middle of the farm in an old farm hand house and to practice pure primary care that was based on, you know, the Hippocratic idea that food is medicine. And in order to do that, because I was on a farm, then we had to figure out how the best way would be to grow this food. And of course, that would be without earth destroying chemicals and, right. and, without, and, with, and with methods that built up the soil, which is the core of human health, right? It's not the plant, it's the soil from which the plant comes. And so that was how all of this came to be. And at the same time, you know, it's become more and more obvious as the years go on that there are now connections to climate change that are enormous um, through agriculture. And it, as a matter of fact, it is now thought that perhaps conventional chemical based agriculture and the food system could be the number one, when you take all of its indirect effects into consideration, right. could be the number one single cause of climate degradation and climate change. Right. It definitely is for other environmental catastrophes such as habitat loss, and, uh, and water. species extinction, things like that. Yeah. But, but um, in any event, we 
so we've we have this farm it's it's uh, it's evolved into what we call the ethos farm project where we try to heal people we we heal the earth through the way we grow things and heal the community and um, we are so excited because uh, we've taken this ethos farm project and and um, imagined it as a new kind of plant based food system mm -hmm. and we have entered the rockefeller foundation 2050 food system vision prize which is a worldwide comp competition mm -hmm. and the ethos farm project was one out of 1300 applicants from around the world we were selected as one of 78 semi-finalists wow uh, who uh and the i might add the only plant-based one for a food wow. system and the end goal is uh to hopefully god willing be chosen uh as a top finalist to go before the un and the world health organization at next year's un food summit to present the plan for adoption uh, uh across the world wow that's so amazing we're very excited about that that's where the ethos primary care has led uh, has led us that that's just amazing i i um my my hat's off to you i <laughs> my uh, my farming consists of pots out on the porch <laughs> well, that's the best con your victory garden right? yeah my victory garden you that's know the best con, the best con yeah we got a little patch in the backyard i could never grow corn though i we we took over the half the lawn at one point and yeah. i just couldn't get the Who, what got it the the birds uh the earwigs the earwig the earworms yeah 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 but you know what you can it's okay uh you know if you the in i don't know what happened to you but a lot of the time the earworms will just they get to the top of the ear yeah but you can break that off and eat the rest of it yeah yeah i just didn't i couldn't get the knack but yeah our biggest challenge was the birds the birds yeah oh my gosh yeah and then we've got raccoons and it's an arm wrestle so we, it the we have blueberries as well and they're kind of nestled right where you can't really go yeah. Is that am I? I'm a bird, but am I supposed to eat something off that bush? I don't know, and they haven't found them so yet. So well, because they're not blue yet. As soon as they turn blue, blue, they'll be like every blue. single bird in the neighborhood will find that bush. <laughs> I know. So it's worth. I didn't, uh, and then you know, it's hard. It's just you know, they they go, yay! You're growing something that we want to eat. <laughs> You eat it, but we want to eat it too. So, yeah. Well, um, so take us a little walk. Let's take a little walk around your farm. And so we can see, see it, you know, through your eyes. Okay. Well, um, we're about an hour west of the George Washington Bridge and the Lincoln Tunnel and the Holland Tunnel from Manhattan. So. You know, most people drive to us from the eastern part of the state on major superhighways, and then you get off on secondary state roads after about 40 minutes. And then um, the, all of that leads you to the road we are on, which is a beautiful road which winds through the Washington Valley, which is, um, stretches through Morris County. Uh, and it's called the Washington Valley because George Washington spent two critical years here, mm -hmm. uh, the most critical of the revolution. And, and his troops were stationed along this road. So you drive through this road and it, and it, and it empties into Long Valley, which is the last municipality in Morris County. And Long Valley is called that because it consists of a, a long, deep valley, which is completely uh, green in the summertime mm -hmm. and in our town alone you know New Jersey people don't consider as a great agricultural state uh, it was in my childhood more productive than per acre than California where you mm -hmm. live wow uh, and we were a produce state um, 
But w when you come to our town, there are 42 preserved farms in our town alone. So we are one of 42. Mm -hmm. uh, and you drive down this road that bisects the valley with a high ridge uh, on, on one side and the south branch of the Raritan uh, on the other side until you get to our farm and you make a left and you turn onto the a gravel road and the, the gravel is crunching under your tires. We will never pave that road. <laughs> and and um, you go under a, a, an allay of, uh, uh, of ancient linden trees. A linden uh, tree is, is what? Linden. Yeah, I've not heard of that. Mm. Yeah, linden, linden is a, well, there are two kinds of lindens, a European linden, and, and, but, and then there's a North American native linden. And linden trees are beautiful trees. They're, I don't know what you have going on there in California, but they're very commonly planted here. The European ones are as shade trees on the street. Mm -hmm. But lindens are, are popular because of two things. Uh, first of all, Linden blossom honey is supposedly one of the best honeys you could possibly buy. Mm. Uh, not that honey is, is, a, is a staple of the whole food plant-based diet. <laughs> okay. And, and there, you can make linden flower tea from the blossoms, which come out about now in June. Ah. And when, when these blossoms on the canopy open, the whole air of the farms has this sweet fragrance. And oh, bees wow. come from miles and miles around. Right. they love these flowers. And you can pick some of these flowers and steep them to make a tea. Oh. So those are the linden trees. And then, of course, uh, Mahler, the composer, wrote one of his fav famous songs, the Song of the Wayfarer. And he describes a, a weary travel falling asleep under a linden tree with the leaves mm. drifting over him while he sleeps. So those are the two linden references. And as you drive, we have our road is this gravel road it's sort of a, a chicane it curves in an s-shaped uh form and then it it goes and pa past this um this these ancient buildings these Ger these german stone buildings the settlers of this land who came from europe were refugees and they were germans and uh we have a complete set of german stone stone buildings which is rare so Mm -hmm. um, we have been designated a National Historic Landmark, and you, you drive past these buildings in, in various states of repair, and, but they're all original. And then you get to the doctor's farm market on your left, which uh, by the time I'd gotten here had completely, the building was probably about 100 years old, the old wooden building had completely caved in. But we resurrected it and raised it again with its original timbers. And today you can go in there and that's where our produce is picked. It sets, sits right outside the field, which is grown in, uh, which we have reclaimed. That field is now is a 15 acre field. It's now certified organic. And wow. hopefully one day will be certified regenerative organic. Wow. Um, and that's a little tour for now. And then that's a, only a little part of the farm. You know, our farm, I know as far as California standards, 342 acres is not much, but this farm, uh, you know, I know there are farms of thousands of acres in California, but this is one of the larger farms in New Jersey. And it's been a working farm for all of its life for th almost 300 years. Every day it's been working and growing food. So we're in the process of restoring it so it can grow food in the in the best way to help the earth and to help people wow so it helps the earth and it grows this beautiful healthy food yeah. so that's fabulous so much history there yes very rich so we have the doctors uh uh roadside vegetable stand. Right. it's called the doctor's farm market and it's open to the public anyone can drive in off the road drive down that gravel drive and just stop at the farm market. We're open on weekends. And, you know, we have our a young farmers incubator project, 
where we invite young, young people onto the land and we train them how to be farmers, we give them housing, and then they sell their produce in the market. Wow. So, so we, we A whole can, other thing you're doing is to, to yeah. pay it forward. You know, to well, play. yeah, so that's, that is one component of what's called the Ethos Farm Project because you know, we have no more farmers left. Farmers are aging. Uh, I think the average age is in the 60s in the United States. There are very few young farmers and of the farmers that exist, very few of them know how to grow food or, or do it in, in a manner that's good for our health and the health of the planet. So we've taken these ideas and now we raise this new generation of farmers. Uh, if you, you go to our website, you can find that out in the Ethos Farm Project. Uh, we are fiscally sponsored by Plant Pure Communities, which is the nonprofit. Uh, we are fiscally sponsored by them. Um, and um, and uh, there are some other components to that Ethos Farm Project, including uh, the restoration of 100 acres of a, a conventional uh, soy corn field with native prairie grasses to this valley. Uh, and we're studying with Rutgers University and the Rodale Institute the capacity of this restoration to sequester carbon and to potentially be used as a solution for climate change. So that's part of our Ethos Farm Project nonprofit. And then the third arm is um, our Ethos Farm Days, where we have these large festivals and people come from actually California <laughs> and Montana and Texas and they come to hear Colin Campbell and Dr. Esselstyn and Michael Clapper and uh, superstars like this yeah. and, and to eat good food and, and to learn about um, health. Wow. So what do you do for your patients then? If you're, if you're not writing them a ton of prescriptions, what could you possibly be doing for their health? <laughs> right, modern well, perspective. Yeah, we get them back on track. I think that, you know, it, it doesn't, people naturally, they don't, I've never met a person who wanted to take a medicine or a drug. Right. Uh, I think they, people default to that because it's easy. But if you could make uh, lifestyle behaviors as easy, they would take that because nobody likes to take drugs. But they default to it because actually, you know, because of many reasons, you know, food, <laughs> bad food can be as addictive as drugs. Yeah, and It's hard for people to get off of that and get away from that. And yeah. it's hard to be constant and consistent with and, and go exercise every day. It's hard. But we try to work with them and, through different techniques like motivational interviewing the patient and through, through education and try to teach them that they can be so powerful in their own lives and, and, and then spread that power to their loved ones and their friends and to the, the environment around them. If they just choose not to be sick and not to take that bottle of pills and if they can get over that initial hardship it's a very beautiful existence that's down the road. And that's what we try to tell the patients when they come in here on their first visit. You know, they have a visit and I go over their life and everything that's gone on in it and why they've come here and how, it, how, they're, what, how they lived it has caused them to have problems. Once in a while we get people who are healthy and who are plant-based who have reclaimed themselves. And then, then it's more of a, you know, looking ahead to prevent problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, <clears throat> so it's, a, it's a, a good discussion. If somebody makes that drive down the windy road to come to your farm to talk with you, that's a, that's a good drive that was a, a good mindset that they were in to make that drive to come to you. So now the constructive discussion can be had. Um, yes, it's a, I think it's a good, it's an appropriate environment. You, yeah. you have to remember when I first started off, uh, the, 
you know, we got uh, the Rutgers uh, MBA program, graduate business program, took on, takes on new businesses, startups to advise them and make business plans for them. As a graduate, you know, as a master's uh, uh, student, uh, um, educational uh, thing. Mm -hmm. And so we applied for that and, and they selected us in the beginning when we got the farm, the medical practice, and, and they made a business plan. And we went before the entire graduate class and the professors in the class said, you know what, we, we, we see this, we're figuring out all the numbers, but it just doesn't make sense from a business perspective that you opened up this medical practice on a farm because the farm's costs are overwhelming. And it just is a deep financial hole. And, you know, you could just rent a room in a medical arts building with cinder block walls and you could just see people there. <laughs> You'd make much more of a living. We don't see that you're, you're we, don't, we don't advise this. <laughs> and they're right. I, I could have... You could have been in a building. Well, maybe you should have, <laughs> right? <laughs> Rented a, a room somewhere with a reception area. And, however, you know, I think that, um, I think that uh, the farm has a certain, and its setting has, a, has an important impact. Wait, you, you can buy the fruits and vegetables there. You know what I'm saying? You can, um, you, you can see the result. Yeah. You know, the person can connect. Yes, to connect. See what they should be doing visually and concretely. And but it's not only that. It's and it's not only the beauty and the bird song and the fresh air that smells so sweet. But I think that it's the realization that um, that nature has rights and those rights supersede the rights of human beings which supersede economic rights and this model is called the rights of nature mm -hmm. and i think it's it brings the person's attention to this natural world and it's important important because if we don't pay attention to that we cannot have human health. And then of course, we cannot have economic health. All of these things, economic health is subsidiary to human needs, which are subsidiary to the needs of nature. And, and I began to realize, well, if that concept is so important, how can I have a, an office in a medical arts building somewhere on the fifth floor when you go up an elevator well, well you know. but the other thing is, if they're coming out to you, they've made some decisions. They, they, they focused on this is a solution for me. I'm making this drive because I want to try this solution, you know, yeah. and they're not going to be surprised uh, uh, by uh, the um, prescription you're going to give them. <laughs> which is a, a salad bowl and <laughs> Hopefully not. if they don't know what they're getting into, if they don't know when they're getting into before they sign up, they're in for quite a, a surprise. But talking about that, um, talking about our listeners, um, what's a couple of tips or tips? I don't know. It's such a generic word, but what I mean is, you know, they're listening um, what's something that they could do? It's a step to improve their health. Uh, if they started this week. Well, a step. Uh, you know, I. Or two. I think you have to know what kind of person you are, and then act accordingly. There are some pe people who I call leaners. They lean into things, and I think most people are like that. Then the rarer individual is someone who just dives in and just does everything, st starts going 100 miles an hour. They don't, they don't gradually accelerate. Right. 
And, and I think, you know, that kind of person can just, you know, read a book or read the China study, close the book and say, that's it. I'm going to, I'm going to take Dr. Campbell's advice and I'm not going to eat, I'm not for 30 days, I'm not going to eat any, anything that has salt, oil or plant, you know, and they're off to the races. But I think most people are not like that. I think most people, uh, because it's, it's so hard, you know, to do, you have to, because basically living a whole food plant-based lifestyle is not a diet. No. It is a religion. <laughs> it, 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 is, it is a faith. It is, it is something. It is a belief system. Diets are not that. And it, just as if I would ask you, oh, let's, you know, hey, would you like to convert to Judaism today? Or Islam, you'd think I was crazy. Uh, just in the same, it's hard for the average person to dive in like that and all of a sudden flip a switch and do it successfully and be you, so you engaged. Make, so, you, you tend to make more food yourself. I mean, I know with Whole Food Plant Based, we have little rituals. My husband has little rituals that he does now routinely. And, you know, five years ago, if you said, Valley, go shopping, I'd go, okay. Well, I know what I'm going to eat. I walk in. I don't really even have to think about it. I know what aisles I'm going to go to, blah, 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 right? But now mm -hmm. I don't go to those aisles. I don't even go to the meat side anymore. Right. Um, and I, I'm not buying the same things. I'm not. But, but now it's a habit. And I don't think about it. But yeah. changing from that point where it becomes the habit, and the old habit is, lo is lost, you know, or it gone. Takes, right, it takes practice. And that's why okay. I think it takes time and it takes practice. And if you're one of those leaners, uh, you know, what I would suggest is start slow and just take one step. Like don't have scrambled eggs for bre breakfast and a yogurt. Just have oatmeal and fruit. And just do that. And then have your chicken chow mein or general chow's chicken for lunch and have your, have your roast beef for dinner, whatever. But just take that one step and be consistent and dedicated. And then maybe you'd like to take a second step. Maybe you'd like to have a big salad for lunch instead of the general chow's chicken. And you can go at your own speed. And, and uh, there is a wonderful book by James Clear called Atomic Habits. Atomic is, Habits? I often recommend to my patients, Atomic Habits. It's okay. not a large book, but it tells, it explains how you can become resilient, resilient in building these habits one step at a time. And that how you can change who you are by this dedicated process of one step at a time. And then eventually you do get to where you are, right? Where you don't, you go into the grocery store and geez, I, I'm not even thinking. I'm not even thinking what I want or where, what I'm going to make. I'm just, I, I left the grocery store and I have everything and I didn't give it a second thought. Because you know you, what, you know. You you're on autopilot. Yeah, yeah. You're on yeah. autopilot. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was funny when I first converted, I was at Dr. McDougall's. I went for a weekend, one of his weekend things. And um, they feed you. Yeah. And so I'm like, because like the first thing is, well, what are you going to eat? You know, I mean, <laughs> and so, so there I was in a room full of people who were all vegan, chowing down, and uh, it can happen, you know, <laughs> and you can eat your fill. Oh, yay, you know. So yeah. when I got back, I was like, okay, what am I going to do? Because I don't really know. So for a week, really about two weeks i just had quinoa and sweet potatoes and I, and then i had regular potatoes and then i had oatmeal because i knew how to make these things and i knew they were on the diet and yeah. i didn't to think about it so in the morning that would be cooking while i was getting ready to go to work and then yep. pop it into something to take with me and off i went but and then i expanded you know from there right? exactly but, yep. 
but you know, I just, uh, uh, I just had to, uh, and just that weekend with McDougal, I lost four pounds. I was like, yes. Hey, we're going in the right direction, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's just a learning thing. And, and, and you just, you just ease your way into it. Um, at, at one point, actually it was before I went up to McDougal's, I was to the point where I was really eating vegan, like, um, four days a week. And then for three days, I, I ate and prepared foods for my husband and, and so on. And I ate with him. But then there was that one day when I ate that meal, my Friday evening meal, non-vegan meal, and it was so heavy. My body was so used to those four days of clean. that yeah. Through all that rubbish in there, my body went, what? Yeah. Huh? You That's see the perfect. contrast immediately. Yeah. And I felt sick and everything felt so heavy, the food. And I was like, oh my gosh. So I had to, I, I was like, what am I doing? This, I, I got to rethink this whole thing, you know? Yeah. And so then I ended up there. And uh, so, so anyway, it was just, it, you know, it, it's a, life's a journey, you know, and yours is so amazing, Dr. Weiss. Yeah. It's just amazing. I mean, what you have done there. I want to go buy land. <laughs> I want to go <laughs> make a farm. Uh, I know it'd be a lot of work, <laughs> but uh, I think you've just done an amazing thing there. And those lucky souls that get to drive that little winding road out to your farm are just blessed. Uh, and I, I think when they get there, They've made up their mind, right? They drove the they drove the drive, right? They got there. Well, not they, always. Okay, I'm going to do this thing. <laughs> not always, but you know, a lot of them have. It takes a long time. Remember, it's it's a religious conversion, really. It is. Food is like it, that. It, you have to, yeah, and uh, you know, sometimes people can remain contemplative for years upon first exposure. Let's say I'm the first person who exposes them. And that's why I decided to come on. I, I'm glad you asked me and I wanted to come on this program today because it's my duty as a physician to be a teacher. Um, it, is, it is intrinsic in being a physician to be a teacher and not just to teach my patients, but to teach people in California. And I'm so glad that the people in Silicon Valley have the opportunity to listen to you and to listen to these wonderful ideas and, and philosophies that you espouse because they can, you, they're healing your community. So, you know, I'm glad I had this opportunity to do that. And however, I understand I'm a pragmatist and I understand because it's like people, you don't, come up to somebody and ask them to change their life within a moment or one visit or an hour or an initial consultation and boom, like a light switch, they're off. It takes for most people a lot of contemplation. So hopefully this session today, for those of your audience who are just hearing the term whole food plant-based will be that point of the beginning of contemplation. Well, thank you so much for uh, sitting down and talking with me. I, I wish my, uh, I was on the machine with the camera. Sorry about that. So it's just, uh, just my logo. Fine. <laughs> but uh, thanks so much for coming on. I, I really, really appreciate it. Um, it's just been, it's, I've, I've walked the journey, you know, with you and I've, it's eye opening. And I, I love what you do out there on the farm. Thank you. I love it. And thanks so much for uh, talking with me today. Thank you for having me.